please welcome Mayor Tom Leather. Thank you very much for having me. As was mentioned, uh, my wife Laura is here. We've been married 26 years. We actually have an anniversary now. And I would tell you that while a number of you feel that we got a lot out of the Reagan administration, I will tell you, Laura and I met in the Reagan administration, so I'm the one that got an awful lot out of the Reagan administration. <laughs> Again, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. You know, for too long, we have had politicians who have never talked to us as adults. The reality of where we are is pretty clear. The president that we have today and those professional politicians have brought us right to the edge of bankruptcy. They crippled our economy. And unless we have different leaders, leaders are going to make some tough choices, we're going to go around down a road that we're never going to be able to come back from. Today, our president is much more interested in redistributing income than rebuilding our country. A president is much more interested in group entitlement than personal accountability. And a president that's much more interested in growing, growing the government as opposed to growing a strong nation. I am not a politician. Five years ago, I would have never thought that I would have ever run for office. I'm a business person. I've seen politicians on both sides that come in and they want to be professional politicians. You can either see it because they've been elected office for 10 years, or you can see that they've worked in government and that's what they want to do is be in elected office. Well, unfortunately, they lack the incentives to really make the changes that are necessary. They will fall into the exact same group. I'm a business person. I've run businesses for 25 years. A variety of different businesses and a lot of different industries. When those politicians come in and they tell you that they're going to cut spending or they're going to create a job, ask them what they've done. I've had to do both of those. The last position I was in, we created 2,300 jobs. I understand how an economy works. My leadership style is driven by two things. By faith and by the Constitution. I was raised by a single mom. She had a real tough deal. I did glorious jobs like being a janitor. She worked very hard. She worked hard not only to support me, but much more importantly to give me a life that was much different than what she had and what we had at that time. All of you, all of you, understand that. You work hard not only for yourselves, but you work hard for your family. The idea of giving your family better opportunities, a stronger nation. Unless we have a course change, we're going to go down to a position where we're never going to be in that position to see stronger opportunities for our nation or for ourselves. That's what this election is all about, and that's what I offer you. Thank you. Do you have other questions? Yep. Straight to the questions. The first is on national sovereignty. The United States of America seems to be losing our national sovereignty as we more frequently seek approval from the United Nations. Many refer to our surrender of our national sovereignty to the UN as a significant step toward the establishment of a one world order. How can we continue to be a part of the UN and not lose our national sovereignty? I am unabashedly the United States should be number one. In everything we do, we should seek to be the leader in this world. We have values, a strength of an economy that in no way should we ever apologize for. Unfortunately, people in Washington think it's a great thing to be able to apologize and in effect move us towards the average. That should absolutely never be our goal. We have allowed the United Nations to play that game with us. We need to do three fundamental things. Number one is reiterate what the fundamental mission of the United Nations is. It's not to do UNESCO and all these other sort of things that we've done on the periphery. It will simply be a forum where people could talk. That's what we need to get back to. Number two. Very simply, we need to ensure that proportional economics play in the game. We shouldn't be able, as taxpayers in this nation, support the United Nations. That doesn't make any sense. And the final thing, we cannot allow the United Nations to spend all of its time going after our allies. And by that, frankly, I mean Israel. Most of the efforts today in the United Nations are going after Israel and trying to deny their right of existence. We need to make sure that we stand up for Israel, and we stand up for the type of principles that are important to our nation. Now, we see that in a lot of different ways. Uh, clearly, some were mentioning the question. Agenda 21, to me, is a perfect example of it. We put out an economic plan, an economic plan that was probably the most detailed and comprehensive plan that any senatorial campaigns put out. In that, we specifically address Agenda 29 as an example 
of the United Nations overshooting its mission, but also endangering sovereignty. The reality of it is that sovereignty should be number one in any international issue that we deal with. It has to be critical. It's the only way to ensure that we will continue to have a nation that's strong and be able to have the values that all of us prize and values that we can carry throughout this world. On the subject of immigration, the U.S. has a long history of welcoming immigrants from all over the world. However, because of the size of our nation and the complexity of our border, it is very difficult to prevent illegal immigration. Do you consider legal immigration to be a significant issue today? And if so, how would you attempt to solve it? Immigration is an important issue. When you solve issues, you always start with principles. My first principle is I'm against amnesty. Laws have to be obeyed and they have to be respected. For us to say all of a sudden in this issue, well, those laws weren't really quite important. What does it put us when we get to the next issue, and the next issue, and that issue? We have to understand that laws are important, they have to be respected. So any solution to immigration has to start with saying we will not allow amnesty. The second element is to ensure that the policy can be successful. We learned in 1986 that if you don't protect the borders, that you have no chance of having any success on the immigration at all. My view on, it, on controlling the borders is really straightforward. You put the people that are going to be responsible, and we can develop the metrics very easily to understand that. And then put accountability in the system. Ask them, what tools do you need? Boots on the ground? Walls? Electronic? Whatever it is, we'll make sure that we provide those tools. But then we're going to hold you accountable for having secure borders. And then we solve the problem. Every day this issue goes on, it costs you and me more money. Education, health care, etc. That's largely because we've got politicians in Washington that don't want to solve problems. What they want to do is do things that don't put them in jeopardy of being elected in the next two years. So as a result, you walk away from problems. You walk away from immigration. You walk away from spending and everything else. We've got to have people that will deal with these problems and be willing to solve them. And again, we elect the same people. People have been in elected office for 10 years, and people who want to elect office, they're going to do the same thing, because that election is going to be important. It's time that we had some people that would put aside their political careers for what's important for our nation, both today and tomorrow. On the budget, the United States is over $14 trillion in debt. I think I need to change that to 15 <laughs> And continues to increase at over $4 billion per day for the foreseeable future. Paul Ryan has unveiled his budget, The Road to Prosperity. Do you support or oppose this plan and why? Well, 15 trillion is bad enough, but it's not anywhere near the right number. I'm a business person. You look at our federal government today, you have to add in the future obligations and the future liability. Any business is going to do that. The accounts are going to come in, and for important reasons, it's not an academic question. It shows the future strength, the future viability, the future prospects of that company, organization, or in our case, our country. We do that, the number is over $60 trillion. $60 trillion. I'm not smart enough to understand what's trillion dollars. But I can do the math. That's $700,000 per household. $700,000 per household. We have let the politicians spend us into the ground. What we need to do is address the spending in a number of different ways. First of all, make some tough decisions. Today, we spend about $3.7 trillion. We only bring in about $2.2. We're in the hole by $1.5 trillion. $1.5 trillion. Everybody in this nation, all of your households, business you work in, understand a simple concept. You live within your means, with one major exception, and that's Washington. They haven't learned that, and you need to learn I proposed in my economic plan a number of steps. One is a balanced budget that caps spending at 18%. That, to have a balanced budget, you have to cap spending. Cap spending at 18%. Go to biannual budget. Go to zero-based budgeting. Do those sorts of things that put discipline into the system. And finally, deal with the entitlement programs in a realistic way. 40% of our spending today is entitlement programs. In a couple of years, it's going to be 60%. Anybody that tells you that they can address the issues in Washington, the fiscal mess that we've got, without dealing with entitlement programs, is either lying to or they've got the head in the sand. We have proposed a very comprehensive program 
not only as Congressman Ryan did for Medicare and Medicaid, but we also dealt with Social Security. In those programs, we say people that are on it, we're going to make sure a deal's a deal. We're not going to change yours. And people that are entering that stage, a deal's a deal. We're not going to change it. But then we're going to go back and make the changes that are necessary to make those programs viable and sustainable, not bankrupt the programs and bankrupt our nation going along with it. That's the detail that we put in. We deal with each of those programs specifically so that you can see where we stand. Most people in politics deal with seven second sound bites and applause line. Unfortunately, I've never seen an applause line that solved the problem yet. You're going to see a comprehensive approach. You're going to see what we feel, and you're going to be able to see and read it and make your own judgments. There's going to be the substance that you can make your own judgments. On the size of the federal government, constitutional scholars seem to agree, or seem to argue, over the scope of the Constitution of the United States. Proponent, proponents of big government cite the General Welfare Clause as the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the states, as constitutional authority allowing the federal government to legislate any and all activity it feels will improve the gender <coughs> welfare. Do you believe the Constitution truly grants unlimited authority to the federal government, as many argue, and if not, why? Absolutely not. The Constitution was framed in a way that made enormous sense, not only then, but now, as we see in the development of our country. It was intended to limit the federal government, and not only to put responsibility on the states, but to put responsibility on you and me. And that's where it ought to be. We have seen the federal government get into areas that simply has no responsibility, no right to be in. And by the way, they can't be very effective or cost efficient when they do those sorts of things too. Government should provide a good national defense. It should protect our borders. And we ought to do those things right. We've got to understand, both because of the Constitution and because of things that we can't afford, we've got to get out of these things. Number one example of that is repeal Obamacare. Now, all the politicians are going to tell you that, and you're tempted to nod and say yes. Ask the politicians, once you repeal Obamacare, what are you going to do? We've laid out a very detailed program, talking about prevention, talking about health savings accounts to put responsibility back on the individuals and the doctors. We've talked about increasing competition by opening up sales of products across state lines, allowing companies to pool together. We talk about tort reform. And finally, we talk about changing the building from, from performance, or excuse me, from process or procedural base to outcome base. So all of a sudden, there's reasons that doctors and patients can make the right economic decision. 